Welcome, everybody. Hey, Deborah, good to see you. Good to see you, too. Hey, Jose, good to see you, too. <laughs> been so long, Eric. It's been I so know, long. Right? <laughs> At least this time we get to talk. <laughs> oh, so everybody, we're, um, I'm doing like heavy duty Zoom duty today. So I'm going to do my best to be uh, personable and, you know, lead our conversation, but I'm also going to be doing the, the Zoom thing. So please bear with me. <laughs> can you guys see that screen? Uh, just so I know I'm working. We can. Cool. All right. Well, let's, uh, well, glad you guys could be here early. Um, we'll get started here in just a second or two. Welcome, everyone. We're glad you're here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we've got folks uh, filtering in. We've got a great turnout so far. We should have a great turnout today for this conversation. So let's uh, we'll give it another uh, minute or two and then get started. Um, I'll make sure that in the chat you have uh, kind of the pertinent background information for today. And uh, again, we're glad you're here. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. We've got a, a good, um, really good turnout of folks. I see 35 
participants, which is excellent. Um, this uh, welcome to our monthly uh, Revitalized Portland Coalition uh, meeting. This one is going to be a little different than the uh, normal meetings that we hold, but we're excited to um, be able to get uh, your feedback and uh, concisely put it in front of uh, Governor Kotak and the Governor's Central City Task Force. So appreciate you taking the time. We added an extra half hour uh, to run till three today and appreciate your um, participating uh, in, the, in the session. Um, we are recording the session so that we can make sure we have uh, good notes to report to the Governor's Task Force. Um, and a couple folks have volunteered also to help me with notes, which I really, really appreciate from our um, board of directors. Um, we are, uh, for, if you're brand new, if you've not been a part of, of RPC today before, um, we welcome you and, and uh, invite you to introduce yourself uh, in the chat, if you would, and let us know who you are and what your organization is. Um, be several different ways you can connect with us if you haven't uh, before. Uh, most uh, easiest is probably to go through our link tree, which I'll just keep putting in the chat um, as we go forward today. Um, but welcome. Uh, we'll also make sure you can get to our schedule of other events um, and join a tap in one of our committees if you're interested or find out more about RPC. You can always connect with me um, in that regard. Um, so please do introduce yourself in the chat if you're new to RPC. Um, we're pleased uh, today to jump right in and, and be able to um, hold this listening session for the, uh, it's called the Value Proposition Committee of the Central City Task Force that the governor um, has convened with uh, Dan McMillan from um, Standard Insurance, uh, The Standard uh, Insurance. Um, this group's been meeting and you've probably seen it in the uh, in the um, uh, news that this group's been meeting for um, a couple of months. Um, they are convening and coming up with their recommendations on by December uh, 11th this year. So they have asked different groups to hold these listening sessions. Uh, we're one of, I think, 15 that this committee um, has, has convened. They're looking for insights and recommendations to develop actionable opportunities uh, for the central city in Portland in the near term. Um, I, there are a couple questions on the longer term as well, so we'll, um, we'll be addressing those. Um, while the task force is focused on a lot of the same issues and committees that we are focused on, homelessness, uh, crime and public safety, uh, public image, um, as well as economic de development and, and housing, um, you know, none of the, all those issues, as we know, are, are very connected. Um, we offered today that we thought our members could provide feedback on kind of the economic trajectory of downtown, um, both, you know, in the near term and the short term, kind of what does that, that mix of uses look like in the future? Um, of course, you can't ignore those other uh, issues and topics in the conversation, as we all know from our time, you know, working together. So, um, you know, invariably other topics will come up and, you know, this is, this is largely meant to be a brainstorming session. There are no, um, there are no wrong answers, uh, if you will. Um, but we do hope that we can help generate some actionable ideas on economic redevelopment and success. Uh, to get to this committee. Um, it is focused on the downtown Portland Central City. Um, the boundaries and definition of that are, are not super critical, um, but just, just uh, keep that in mind as we're, as we're talking. We obviously, as an organization, are focused on the economic well-being of the whole county and the whole region. Um, so we do have, I've put the background information uh, in the chat. Um, I'm also going to put the questions uh, in the chat as well um, so that you all can um, uh, see those as we go. Um, but let me do this first. 
Um, so you can also, if you if you decide to screenshot or take a picture with your camera, you can see the survey and questions. It's what I've shared on the screen. Um, so that's one way to do it. Um, the other way is I'll drop the link in the chat um, so you can respond that way. We do encourage you to do written responses as well as verbal. I mean, we'll obviously capture the verbal responses as we talk today. Um, but written, you know, gives you a chance to to do um, uh, have more detail, more flavor into what you're saying. So if I can just get this thing to pull up, there we go. Um, here's a link that will get you to the questions and the answers, and and your let you allow to enter enter your um, responses, and that'll be up uh, even after the meeting today. So if you want to come back and and you know make sure you've gotten your answers in that survey. Great, uh, that'll just help us as we compile everything for um, the group. Um, so, you know, I mentioned uh, briefly uh, our four subcommittees and the committees that our, our folks are doing. Um, and uh, this, this slide actually, we compiled uh, two of us, Jose Cienfuegos, who's on the call also, and I uh, were supposed to present to the Governor's Task Force Committee on Crime and Safety this morning. Um, they ran out of time, so we'll be talking to them again next week, um, but we're going to be talking about our specific uh, Revitalized Portland Coalition proposals around um, uh, crime and safety downtown. Um, so here's, we've got our listening session today um, for the, the task force. Um, I think everybody pretty much knows the Zoom uh, mechanisms, but if you don't, and I keep talking about use the chat. Um, you can see this red arrow points to where that chat feature is. You ought to be able to click on that and offer uh, comments or um, questions as we go. Um, I'm going to put the questions on the screen so you'll be able to see them there. But um, so you have two choices there. You can either uh, enter your question, your answers in the chat, or you can do the um, survey that we shared as well. And then, of course, we want you to talk uh <laughs> in addition so uh just trying to make sure you have multiple ways uh to engage with the conversation um oh and once again there's the link where you can uh you can take a picture of that and enter your um survey question answers there um so any outstanding questions before we just jump in and, and get started um I'll just ask you to speak out loud because I can't really see much as from my uh, screen. So if anybody's just got any burning questions or updates they want to mention before we start. All right, good stuff. Well, I hope you'll be uh, talkative as we go forward. Um, so the first question that we're going to address is kind of is on the vision um, focus for downtown. So the question is, what should the central city of Portland be known for? Um, this one's got th three sub questions to kind of help you generate and get that get that thought process flowing. What big idea could be transformative for the central city? Uh, when you think about the central downtown area of Portland or a similar mid-sized city, what attractions come to mind? What of those attractions could be uh, beneficial to Portland's central city? And then each neighborhood across Portland has distinct characteristics and amenities that bring people together. If the central city is to become a destination again, what should it look like and feel like? Um, special prize to whoever um, whoever answers first. They'll be in my. They'll get my eternal gratitude. <laughs> so on the vision thing, what sh what should send the central city? What would we like it to be known for? Safe. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, Terry, I know you said something. It, was, it cut off. I, I just said safe. Um, that's probably the biggest issue with like our staff and tenants is that they don't feel safe. 100%, Terry. I think downtown needs to be a safe place to live, work, shop, play, yeah. worship, and host tourists. Yeah. Eric, I was thinking about my spouse and what she would say, and she would say clean and safe. Yeah. Yeah. I want to be able to walk on the sidewalks at nine o'clock at night and not feel like I might get mugged. Yeah. 
I don't know that during with, the day. So <laughs> sorry. Oh no, I was gonna say along with that, I think and I think it's kind of along the same lines is that it has to, I, I'd like it to be inviting. Mm -hmm. uh, a place where you would look forward to going. Uh, that will probably transition into the second part of this question, but um, I, I, I'd like to see that. Well, and we don't have the restaurants and the retail that we used to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone just said business district and fine dining. So I agree. Interesting. The responses are not so much around the big transformative, but more around the return to safety and uh uh amenities that maybe we had once in the in the past mm -hmm. so, yeah it's and what i'm sharing I, I intentionally just shared their question straight away with you all because i thought you know it gives us a feeling of what they're asking but we answer however we want and i think this is instructive so uh it looks like darlene you have your hand up you know, when I visit cities, I, I love the downtowns of cities. And so, and I do love the downtown of Portland. And I look for, and these are not transformative. These are things that I love in an inner city. I love the shopping in an inner city. I love the eating in the inner city. And I love the entertainment of an in inner city. Safety, of course, is so relevant and cleanliness is so relevant but for me, shopping, eating, entertainment is why I go to center cities across mm -hmm. the world. That's why I visit them. And I, there was one thing that we used to have that we don't have so much anymore, but the music, the, the busters on the street were so fantastic. Some of them were so extraordinarily talented and I haven't seen them in over a year. So that kind of entertainment, just, you know, the street musicians are gone. I mean, there's, so I'm going to, this is not transformative, but shopping, <laughs> eating, and entertainment is relevant for me. That's why I live downtown. So that's great. Um, are there other downtowns or central city areas from other similar cities that, you know, you think about Darlene or others uh, when you think about what you'd like to see Portland become? You know, I think Eric, I don't mean to interrupt there someone if they want to go ahead. No, go ahead. I go well, ahead. I, you know, I'm thinking about the 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 transformative word in that in that that sentence. And so, you know, if you want to think a little bit bigger about, you know, what Portland had or has and isn't being felt comfortable enough to visit or has left, but kind of go transformative, we have a city with a river going through it that we seem to not take advantage of. We don't have a lot by the river. Uh, that's probably be by design. And maybe I'm, I, I might be going the wrong direction for some people, but we don't include the river in in our city. It just is that thing that divides our, our city in two and, and we have bridges that are paying the butt to get across. And it would be neat if it became kind of a central part of, of our city. And I think of like, that part of Vancouver, Washington, that's now on the river with the restaurants that look right over it, um, that type of thing, where it's it's a it's a part of the the beauty there, as opposed to just being a spot, big body of water next to grass in a, in a sidewalk. So when we think, and I think transformative, that to me personally, that would be transformative is to to have some build around the river, especially in the downtown area. Um, you know, we've got the industrial side on the, on the, on the east side and kind of, like I said, the big green space, which is very nice. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but I think there's more that can be done there. That would be transformative. Good. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you, Jose. I, uh, let's see, I'm trying to make sure I get it in order, um, of who's got their hands up. Well, I'll just go down the list. Uh, let's see. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, Mirta, do you want, you Please let us know your answer. Yeah, I first would just like to echo Darlene's comments and add that, you know, I'm a native Oregonian and I remember, you know, taking the bus downtown even in high school and just that feeling of comfort. Um, and one of the things I feel like that we've seen over the course of many recent events is that the arts 
have kind of gone a little bit by the wayside because people aren't feeling as comfortable going downtown. So maybe some kind of um, trans, uh, like a, a material concrete transformative action would be to encourage um, and implement a mural and murals and art exhibits similar to how, um, you know, downtown Philly has, you know, a, they have a mural tour and the, it's specific and it's deliberate and um, it's actually quite lovely. So maybe with a focus on, you know, neighborhoods and, you know, what, what Portland is known for or, you know, those kinds of things. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, Richard, you're next. I was just um, thinking on the transformative word. Um, it, we seem to have a big difficulty getting people back to the office, and we're talking about um, a, a pretty big lift in trying to get um, residential con uh, office converted to residential. But the the real key to a a city, and I think. Every, every city is going through this. I, I'm not sure there's a, a good example of a, a perfect city post-pandemic. But if we're going to transform, we need to, we need to be on that mission for a 24-hour city, something that's alive um, uh, 24 hours a day, and a 15-minute city where the people that live in it can get to uh, most of their basic needs within 15 minutes, either walking or on public transportation. And if we can do something like that, we've, tr we've truly transformed Portland and it becomes an opportunity instead of the obstacle it is right now. Great. Well said, Richard. Vadim. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I, there are cities out there that have recovered post-pandemic. You have Austin, you have Nashville. There are some where the foot traffic is back and, in fact, growing. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, we have our Maslow's hierarchy of needs here in Portland. We do need safety. There's no question. Number one complaint that all of us hear is we don't want to go to, you know, downtown, old town, name your place because of the perceived and the real uh, aspects of this safety crisis we have. But really, what do people come here for? You know, it's, it's once again, that, that music, that uh, companionship that you can get around a meal, or drinks, and so on. Um, and that'll bring people back. And so I agree with the river. We need to revitalize that aspect of uh, people love to congregate around there, whether it be the James Beard market or music venues, as I think are being contemplated on both sides of the river. Uh, you know, I'm reminded of the story that was in the Oregonian a while back um, about the uh, visitor center that's right there on a waterfront, but is now being used as office space um, by, by uh, I believe it's the city. But, um, you know, those sort of things are areas where we can grow into. Uh, but I want to echo there's, you know, un until we get um, a hold of um, the, the safety crisis we have right now and beneath all that, the drug crisis, um, that's going to be difficult. But um, I, I think, you know, obviously entertainment is is the future, if anything. Uh, let's see, Susan, how are you? Good to see you. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you, too. Um, just to echo what Vadim was talking about, you know, there is a group of about five or six of us that are running nonprofits that are really focused on public spaces and reasons for why residents want to come downtown. And I think, you know, we really need to differentiate social services over here that are, you know, to address and make sure we're creating a safe environment around, you know, housing and drugs and crime. But in terms of why people want to come downtown for the James Beard Market or the Green Loop or the food pods or... Um, a healthier waterfront, the Human Access Project, and, and some of the great work they're doing with the river cleanups and creating more um, beach and waterfront access, let alone for a ferry service. And so, you know, we're, we're here with new, innovative, transformative solutions. Um, there's a lot of federal funding out there. 
And um, really the um, impediment is just the, the partnership and having a shaking of the hand with some of these public agencies in order to access federal dollars. So that's what's so frustrating for us when we're hearing so much about the need for this revitalization and helping to increase that foot traffic around the downtown core. But it's we're just tripping on ourselves where we just can't find the, the partners to help us unlock the federal funding. That's great. That's great. Thank you, Susan. Let's see. Next, I've got Deborah MC. Yes, I um, had the opportunity um, a week ago to go with the chamber to a best practices trip to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I think the comments that folks have made about using the waterfront are really critical. They have the largest uh, uh, musical festival in the world in Milwaukee. And um, we were down on the waterfront at all times of day and felt safe and it was clean and it was being used in a number of different ways. So I just have to echo that waterfront um, uh, idea. That's great. Uh, Tom, you're next. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't mean to be flippant about this, but the, the bumper sticker says, keep Portland weird, right? And right now, I don't think we're weird. I think we've got kind of a bad or not a, not a great rep out in the nation. And, and so I, what I think we need is, is, I don't know if this quite fits in the question, but a good PR campaign. And we need some icons. You know, we don't need another a statue of our mayor in a trench coat, but uh, I do miss the elk. I like that. I never understood why we had the statue of an elk, but I think I want the elk back. And I think we need some other iconic things for Portland. That's great, Tom. Thank you. Uh, Josh. Schlesinger, welcome. Hey, thanks so much, Eric. And thanks to you all for being here today. I think um, the question is kind of a typical Portland question that uh, is rooted in this like big idea transformation. I, I think it's basic and people have said that. And I think the path to hell is paved with good intentions and we continue to not deliver on the basics. And to me, if the basics, cleanliness, safety, a desire to want to be in that environment is going to breed new ideas. And those ideas will be transformative at the next step. But the basics are not being delivered and haven't been for the last 36 plus months. And I think that is the, that's what we need to focus on. We need to want to go back to our home downtown. I love, and I've worked here 20 years, almost every day, even through COVID and uh, this place was a beautiful and wonderful place because of the basics. It was livable, it was clean, and people wanted to be here just because we did the basics. It's not like we had the space at all. So for me personally, I feel like delivering on the basics is going to result in a collaborative, more spirited community that is authentic and long lasting. And that's my personal opinion. Thank you. No, thank you, Josh. Somebody said to me when I first got here that you know, other cities have their X, you know, Portland, I mean, Seattle's got its tech sector and the sports teams and Portland has its livability and its you know, desire of people to want to be here. So that's, that's well said. Hey, Ross, you're next. Thanks. Yeah. Just touching on it. Um, touching on everybody else on just the basics and safety, I, just because we're throwing around ideas um, rather than being transformative. I just think we, we should talk about something to do to incentivize retail tenants. Hmm. Um, obviously that's gonna help with safety, that's gonna help with crime, that's gonna help with vibrancy, but when you have people working here or people coming from out of town and you walk by boarded up after boarded up vacant retail, it, it's it's detrimental to having people come back to downtown. So whether it's getting back to the foodie place we used to be or just having bringing people back down for foot traffic, I there hasn't seemed to be a big push in my opinion to help retail tenants get there. There's very few right now, and then they have to deal with bashed up windows, et cetera. So anything they could do that that would be, I think, welcome for just about everybody. That's great. Thank you. I appreciate everybody's uh responses on question one. Uh I'm gonna move to Tom Ped to ask question two. Tom, are you good with that? Good to go. Cool. So the second question is. Uh, regarding success short term, what would success look like for the central city by next summer 
assuming bold action by uh, the public sector. I don't know who put that assumption in there, Eric, but. They did, the, the task force put that in there. All right. <laughs> Being transparent, <laughs> big assumption. Well, and I guess, you know, part of it is what is that action? What are the things we need from the public sector as well? Right, by next summer, short term. Uh, I like what Brian said in the uh, in the chat, uh, deliverable that is 25% uh, uh, reduction of crime in the CBD. Others, what are some of the low hanging fruits? What are some of the things we could get done in my summer? Hey Eric, I just got my audio working. Can I can I address the first question? Of course. Good to see you, Paul. Or good to have you here, Paul. Thank you. Um, just to echo some others, but I think the biggest thing is people need to come back. If people show up, the restaurants are going to open, the boardings are going to come down, the festivals are going to start. So getting people into downtown Portland is critical. I'm on next door in my area out in Aloha. And they all, as far as they know, downtown is burnt down. All of the, the only people that are down there are drug dealers and killers and terrible <laughs> people, which we all know is not true. I work down there every single day through COVID. Yep, it wasn't pretty. But getting people back is the most critical thing. So that's that's just for the number one. Uh, number two, I think, goes right along with it. Getting people back downtown. How do we do that? If people are downtown, and I'm noticing in the last six months, a lot of people, you know, parking spots are taken. So people are coming back. It's just a matter of what do we need to do? Grab Taylor Swift and bring her to Portland so that everybody comes downtown Portland? I don't know. <laughs> that's just my thought. Hey, Eric, I'm I'm sorry to just interrupt and jump in the line with the hand holding up. I've been trying to find the hand. Can't oh, find the hand. Go oh, ahead. Thank you. Claps and thumbs ups and things Don't like that. So, <laughs> so uh, just really quickly to, to speak to kind of both of these questions. One burning thought that I have is what do we know about the people that are coming to downtown already? I mean, we have the farmer's market and I'm guessing, I am apologize, that's called James Beard Market, the, the Portland market that happens on Saturdays. Like the people that are coming downtown regularly, it would be good to understand, you know, why they're coming down and what would maybe help them to want to come down more. And then further, what are the other reasons that people are going downtown regularly? You know, whether it's a BNI group or it's, uh, um, I don't know, uh, creative mornings, you know, all the different reasons that people could go downtown if, if there'd just be more information about that and then just inviting them if we're trying to get people to go down more, how do we get people to that are already inclined to going to go more and to, and to bring their friends. So thank you. And if anybody can send me the hand, I'd be happy to use it. You did it right. If you can't use the tech, if the technology is not working for you, just do that. That's great. Uh, Glenn, you're next. Uh-oh, I thought Glenn was wrecked. Glenn Traeger, are you there? Yeah. Oh, cool. Hey, Glenn. Yeah, I'm looking at the question and I'm saying, what does success look like? And uh, I live in the uh, central city. And when I go it's outside, there's not a day that goes by where I see people with open air drug use. Uh, there's not a day that goes by that there's increased graffiti. We clean it up. We do a very good job. We have a lot of good people out there cleaning up these things, but two, three days later, it comes back again. As far as what does success look like, getting rid of the trash. We have hundreds, maybe thousands of volunteers that go out there each week and, and try to clean uh, trash, but it just comes back again. So, and, and success is not only just the things that we see today, but doing something so it doesn't continuously, every day, just come back. Well said, well said. I think the constancy 
uh, is an issue as well as I think the point that was made previously around, you know, a lot of the surveys around why people aren't coming back downtown certainly point to public safety of perception of, of, of issues that are here. We all try to promote that it's, you know, maybe not as bad as you're hearing. However, there's still some massive issues with that topic. So anyway, Andy, I think you're next. Yeah. Um, to pile on Glenn's comments. So I work downtown every day, right by Pioneer Square. Uh, fairly new to this, been down here for four months. And the open air drug use and the aggressiveness, I would say, of some of those folks, um, really for me, I have a seven-year-old and a five-year-old. And I was born and raised in Portland. And we've lived in our little bubble in Cedar Hills, Beaverton area. I wouldn't bring them downtown right now. So to not be able to bring at any time of day my seven-year-old and five-year-old down to where I work out of fear that I have to protect them or explain to them what's happening when somebody's smoking from some foil or a pipe. Short-term success to me would be being able to bring my children downtown mm -hmm. and feel safe. Thanks, Andy. Margo is who I have next. Margo, I can't see you. You might be muted. Okay, now I'm unmuted. There you go. Uh, thank Hi. you. Yeah, thanks for calling on me. I um, uh, many of you know that I have a small business leading walking tours downtown, so I have a unique opportunity to see uh, our city through the eyes of other people. Most of the people who take my tours are coming here from other countries. So they, uh, they have a very, very different idea, uh, a perception of, of our city. And I can tell you from just a very quick visual fix that would help us is if we, in places where we have um, uh, a vacant storefront, if we could use that window space as a mural, get somebody, there are loads of people here who would be very willing uh, to charge a small amount to uh, put up murals. Uh, the murals could be for sale. Uh, it would just do a lot toward uh, trying to make things visually appealing downtown. Really good example of short-term uh, low-hanging fruit fix that we ought to be able to figure out. Thank you, Margo. Uh, Jose, you're next. Unmute. Um, you know, sorry. Short, yeah, I fell for it, didn't I? Uh, I think short term for me is is that just recently I had to agree uh, with my ex that we couldn't let my 13 and 14 year old kid uh, use the Max and TriMet anymore. And I was just following some stabbings that had occurred of a couple of young kids on the Max, you know, and, and I used to be a, a, a the uh, public defender and a deputy district attorney uh, here in Multnomah County. And so, you know, I always thought that I had a really bad view of a negative view of the crime that occurs in our city. Uh, but I had to, you know, admit with my ex and say, you know what, probably for the time being, we're going to have to not let them, you know, roam about, you know, they have these student passes, which is really nice, but if I can't ensure that they're going to be uh, safe when they, you know, travel, uh, around, which is such a neat thing for them to be able to do in the city if they could do it safely. Um, I, I can't do that. So I think short term, I think is we get the law enforcement and the prosecution kind of following through with uh, some of these uh, prosecution of crimes and, and having some accountability, uh, not only for the offenders, but also having some accountability for the agencies that are in charge of the prosecution and the citation of crimes. Um, and also I, I think it's not too much to ask is that we have a little bit more um, supervision uh, law enforcement wise on the, um, the uh, transit system. Um, it seems uh, that we're just not, uh, I mean, it, it, there's too many people that rely on that, not just myself getting kids, I mean, letting kids roam around, but they need to go there for their for their jobs. You know, they need to take tr public transfer for the jobs every day. Uh, and if you feel like you're not safe, that, that's gotta be a horrible choice for them because they have to get on uh, this Mac. So we have to get on this bus and not feel safe. And so in the short term, I don't think it's asking too much that, you know, with some bold action, 
uh, from the public sector, uh, that we could expect that crime would start to decrease, especially violent crime, person-to-person -person crime uh, on our transportation systems. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Uh, Josh. Assuming that we can cover their basics with safety, I'd love to see in the short term, the daytime population increase by at least 50% in, in the central city. And I think one path in which we could potentially do that is by creating a state um, tax incentive for people to return and be you know pioneers again in central city, if I can use the pioneer word. <laughs> um, but Portland is two thirds of the state GDP. If it, you're not gonna get a lot of public buy-in if, if this incentive is going to landlords or if this incentive is going to big businesses or medium-sized businesses. I think where you can get impact is if you say to the employees, we're going to give you a $2,000 tax credit at the state of Oregon level for the next 48 months to coincide with the business license tax um, policy that was just enacted the city. And what that means is in exchange for that $2,000, you're coming to work three to four times a week in the central city. And to me, that's going to have a major multiplier effect. Those, those individuals are going to uh, frequent the restaurants, the, the shops. And I think it will dilute the experience of the street where, to Andy's point, you have to walk through fentanyl. So, seeing some other people around who have the same kind of purpose in life will be fantastic. That's great. That's great. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Tom, you want us to move? We'll move on to the longer term question, or do you think we got that answer? <laughs> uh, what, what I thought I would do is I was trying to keep an eye on the chat. It took me 28 minutes oh. to figure out the hand and then 30 minutes to figure out the chat. But uh, so I, I wrote down notes and and what I what I have for the answer to number two is, is crime reduction, uh, pick up trash, cover up graffiti, events for families and kids in the downtown area, uh, eliminating open air drug use, improving safety on mass tra uh, mass transit, um, in increasing foot traffic downtown, uh, getting the public sector back to work. Um, somehow, uh, maybe with increased uh, presence of officers, uh, dealing with the aggressiveness of uh, some of the street folks, uh, making the town, uh, the city more visually appealing, prosecution of crimes, consistent prosecution, Accountability of agencies. I thought that was a great idea by Jose. Um, and then um, the, the tax incentive. I, I think the tax credit is is a great idea. Um, I think we really need to highlight that one too. So that's what I got for number two. And if I missed something, just let me know. Hey Tom, just real quick. Yeah. This is just a more of a question that I think somebody here or you'll know. Uh, maybe Josh will. Is that when that? I remember a long time ago when I first moved here for law school. We wanted people to move into the Pearl because we thought that was going to be a big ask. And we we got a lot of tax credits for those people, didn't we? I, I see the, the head nodding. So I think that's a grand idea. I mean, we've obviously done it before when we thought it was necessary to, to get people motivated into an area that we thought was going to be a, a hard sell, which unfortunately has become a hard sell again. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. Question number three, success long-term. What would success look like for the central city in five years? Again, assuming bold action from the public sector. You know, I'll start real quick. Um, I, I think we need to start, and I, I, I'm gonna go a little shorter than five years, but it'll be within those five years. We need to start getting those those businesses that left our city to come back. Uh, I don't know if it's going to take that long. Probably will. We've got place. Uh, you know, Target is is a big one, a national one. Um, but you know, shorter term ones. We we had a lot of the iconic businesses businesses that we had downtown uh, go to the suburbs. Uh, I'd like to see them return. Uh, I think if you know success in five-year terms means we're taking care of a lot of some of the concerns we've all been talking about. Uh, the, you know, law enforcement, prosecution, uh, making it clean, uh, you know, taking care of the blight, um, murals, uh, you know, making an abiding place. I think we could expect in five years, hopefully as a measure of success, that we get some of the companies that have left 
uh, who, by the way, employ people. And then obviously those people will be downtown and increasing the traffic that we need downtown. So for me, uh, that time period, success would be getting those companies back that have left. I'm going to, uh, I know Darlene's got her hand up, but I'm going to echo, I'm, I'm not pointing out all the stuff in the chat. If uh, Take a look if you get a chance. I'm sorry I spent four, my, my COVID time I was at a university, so I learned how to use Zoom, probably overuse it, so sorry. <laughs> but check out the chat if you could. I want to echo what Ryan, my colleague Ryan Shara said, which is we don't have five years. I think it's really hard to have this conversation in the midst of the fires burning all around us. Um, the times that I talk about five years are when I flip it and ask the elected officials, what do you think your revenue is going to look like in five years? What do you think your tax base is going to look like in five years? Because I certainly don't think we spend enough time right now uh, analyzing that. And if we don't turn things around, I think we'll have dramatically less capability to do any of this kind of stuff. Sorry, that's me offering a comment and I probably shouldn't have, but Darlene, turn it over to you. <laughs> I just have another short comment and, and it kind of, I see, I see here in Old Town a lot and <clears throat> the gentleman that was talking about bringing his kids downtown, that just makes me so sad. And I see it in Old Town, too. And I worry about the kids if they're walking down the street with their dad or their mom. And there's, you know, they're each got a hand with their parent and they're walking through Old Town and, and they're walking through, you know, bodies laying on the street and people doing drugs. We've got to get this public drug use thing under control. I mean, who would want to bring their kid down to, you know, pass five kids that are five people that are either a having a psychotic break or snorting something through a straw. This open drug use has got to stop. And we could do something about that quickly, I would think. If we just said, as Nancy Reagan would say, just say, no, you can't do it in the streets. I hated to use that, but I had to. It came to me. <laughs> um, we've got to stop the open drug use. That makes it just plain scary. And then the effects of the drug use make it even a lot scarier so this open drug use has got to go and it it scares me for the kids downtown others have a comment i just have one other can we change that you guys are into this more maybe than me on this level what's the word on that can we get this open drug use off the streets is that viable or is that a no-no is there a reason we can't? Eric, you want me on this one? or? Yeah, I was going to say, somebody on here is going to, I could try, but yeah, go ahead. You know, unfortunately, you know, the city has done a, a great step saying, if we could, here's what we would do. We would, we would not criminalize it. We would penalize the open use. The problem is, is that uh, it's going to take a legislative fix. And so it's going to take uh, the people at the state level. Uh, to get uh, something changed. There's a couple different things working against us. There's was already in the statute uh, when 110 was passed, uh, hindering municipalities from creating their own rules on open use of anything except for marijuana and alcohol. Now, if I get this wrong, guys, I don't have it in front of me. So I I'm going off of memory here, but uh, that's ORS 430. Um, and so while that's on the books and or we don't do something about 110 uh, or combination of those two, or maybe something completely different, it might this because I, I don't want to give open this up into a debate, but just to answer your question directly, Portland's done what it can, and now we need the state to do what it needs to do, the legislative branch of the government uh, to kind of change something so that we have a little bit more teeth. Um, and like I said, I'm not opening up a debate. I'm just saying, addressing your particular question. Hey, Jose, would you mind sharing a little bit of the information that was shared with you with officers on the ground and the citations of the tickets they can give out and the things they would like to do if they could, what their perspective is? Well, I, I think what we hear, and I hear this quite a bit from a lot of officers, is, is that they feel hamstrung. You know, there's really not a whole lot that they can do given the rules uh, that we have at this point in time. Um, you know, right now at this point in time, it's not illegal for them to possess 
and or use those drugs, even though they're not supposed to, they are, that's in fact happening. I think what we hear a lot from the law enforcement is just a frustration of there's nothing that we can do at this point in time uh, and that things need to be changed. Um, and they want to do something different. They want to be able to do something that they used to be able to do. Now, I'm not advocating throwing people in, in jail or prison. I, and like I said, I'm not opening up that that for a debate. I'm I'm just kind of answering Tom's question is, is that what we hear from law enforcement is, is that their their hands are tied, they're frustrated, they'd like to do something different, but at this point they can't. Um, so, uh, and Tom, if you heard something else different that I'm not hating on, just please let me know. Yeah, no, not at all. Um, I'm going to keep rolling with Andy. Yeah, looking at the uh, five-year success, uh, I work in commercial real estate, and a lot of these businesses moving out, let's call it to Lake Oswego or Hillsborough or Beaverton, they're actually signing shorter leases, not the 10-year lease you would expect, because they're waiting to see what happens, right? They're, they're signing a five-year lease, and they're saying, let's see what happens in four years, and then we'll, then we'll see if we want to come back. And their number one reason for leaving has been safety. Safety, the open drug use, their employees don't want to come downtown. So we need to change that and make it safe so that they do want to come. And we all know once the businesses move back in, the restaurants will move back in and the retail will move back in. They'll follow the people. And we have, again, just a little note, we have a wonderful culture of creators in Portland, makers. I came from the apparel industry and you, you have people who just make things in Portland, not just footwear and apparel, but you have just makers. And we could easily have these people in office buildings in Portland and have their retail shops below. We have so many buildings that could be set up that way, but all the businesses are leaving out to the suburbs. So we need to have it be safe so they can come back. Uh, let's see, Ellen, you're next. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for letting me share. My my comment is really about meeting 100% of the demand that we have for mental health addiction issues with medical facilities and the staff that's required right now. That is a huge issue and not something short term to fix. I don't even know if it can be done in five years, but we are at the lowest in the country. And so any solution that we're talking about is not solved by dropping people off at a care emergency room. They're out of day, lacking the care that they need. So I think just the amount of space and staff and getting those funded um, would be my one idea. Five years. Great. Thank you. All right, why don't we move again? These questions are just meant to to uh, inspire conversation. So, and we'll collect everything. I think I think just to point out, you all putting these um, detailed responses either in the chat or in the survey is really really helpful. And you know, one of the cuts we'll do of this is like, what's a tactical item? I think sometimes we get lost, you know, where our elected officials get lost in shiny objects versus what's in front of them, what's what's doable. So. We'll try to organize our report into tactics, you know, and strategy to kind of make sure that the low hanging fruit or, or some of these things are specifically addressed. Uh, we'll also call out what is, you know, kind of regular order of business for most cities that we need to upgrade or get back to uh, in some ways. So uh, I think our reporting will be pretty important. Um, hey, we're going to move on to, oh, sorry. Who, sorry, Eric. I, I thought please. I. You talked about taxes a little bit, and I'm not oh, sure yeah. Good point. Good. if somebody said this, but um, you know, definitely one of our board members will be, is a strong advocate of elimination of taxes. You know, we have the highest marginal tax rate here in, in, in Portland, besides New York City. Um, and then there are some taxes that we could either lower or change or maybe just flat out eliminate. I don't know if that's something that was on the table, but another idea. No, I actually think that is important to raise in this context because this task force is one of the few, I think, public forums where the tax question has actually been addressed and is, you know, they want that feedback. So I think that's important. Um, Jerry Mildner is the person Tom was talking about. Our, he's chairing our committee that works on economic and housing issues. Uh, several of you are members of that. Um, feel free to join if you'd like. I'll put the link in the chat of when those events are. 
when that committee meets. Anything else on taxes before we move on? It's a big topic. Uh, Kevin, hey, yeah, Kevin's a member of that committee. Hello, yeah, yeah, I would love to uh, talk a little bit about uh, taxes. And so, you know, I, I think that, I mean, I don't have any firsthand knowledge, but it seems to me that this committee on the task force that's focused on taxes for services is looking a lot at some of the newer taxes. Um, and so I hope that, you know, what doesn't get lost in that shuffle is property taxes. Um, I really hope that that uh, committee uh, looks specifically at uh, the city of Portland's property taxes. And, you know, I know that, you know, we pay property taxes to different government entities. Maybe other folks have, have thoughts on, on those, but the one I can speak to is the city of Portland. And if you look at the property tax revenue the city of Portland is collecting, 30% of all of that property tax revenue uh, is just going to one bureau, the Fire and Police Disability and Retirement Bureau. And the reason for that is because it turns out the city of Portland uh, runs the most costly uh, public pension plan in the United States. And so I really hope that, um, you know, that this committee and this task force look at um, the city of Portland's property taxes. Um, and, you know, kind of a separate um, issue for the, the city of Portland's property taxes more broadly um, is property tax compression. And so, you know, taxes for service uh, is the name of that committee. Um, and um, right now, the county is estimating that um, offices are declining in value by 30% uh, this year. The, the property tax bills were just released. Um, and so, you know, I just looked at the 25 largest office buildings um, in uh, Portland by square foot. And it looks like, uh, according to the, the property tax bills, you know, before any kind of appeals or anything, uh, the amount of property tax revenue lost from just those 25 office buildings is going to be, for the city of Portland alone, is going to be $1.7 million of, of lost property tax revenue. Um, so to the extent that uh, office building values are declining more than the county is, is estimating, it, that's only going to be worse. Um, and again, that's just the, the top 25 buildings. So, um, you know, I, I think that this decline in property tax revenue is uh, something that you know, strangely, people are are not talking about. Kevin, thank you. That's great. I think you're right about the 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 longer the older taxes as well as the newer ones like pre-K uh, and the supportive housing services tax, which we're digging into heavily on the homelessness side of things. Um, okay, I'm going to move us to question four. Um, Jose, do you mind doing taking that one? I do not. Is it coming up? Or oh yeah, sorry, my bad. That's all right. Here we go. I'm relying on you, Eric. I'm relying. No, I know. On you. <laughs> uh, number four. What are the top three things you or your organization will consider doing to support the overall revitalization of the central city, assuming you got the support you need from the city? and other partners. Now, this should be an easy one for this group because we've got several committees working on several things, but I can say, uh, you know, I'll go ahead and answer part of this. Because yeah, I was gonna say, I might interject, Jose, that you do your the answer for the Crime and Safety Committee. And if Tom's there, maybe he could talk about the Homelessness Committee's work on the county and, and accountability, then we can go into the discussion. Absolutely, you know, I, I think, uh, the really neat thing about our organization is that we can answer this and, and really say that we're putting uh, rubber to the road uh, because we're willing to do a lot uh, for our city. Um, we're invested. We're shareholders. Uh, you know, we are here to, to try to make the change in any way we can. As far as uh, specifics, you know, the crime and, crime and safety aspect of this is, is that our committee has put together um a civil compromise uh, uh, diversion type package based on civil compromise um, statute. And really what it's there to do is just to give or to make sure that there's some accountability, not just for the offender, but also for the agencies that were in charge of um, not only you know prosecuting the crime, but also charging the crime. That is law enforcement and the DA's office. Um, you know, the perception is uh, that 
when you talk to people is that there's no accountability. And in fact, this morning uh, I was watching the, the news and of course they had a, uh, on tape these uh, gentlemen vandalizing um, that crazy guy who gets on and screams at the radio about his car stereos, outrageous car audio, you know, and they were interviewing him. And the first thing that came out of his mouth, uh, like I think it is for a lot of people is, is that there's no accountability and, and, and no one's ever getting charged. And I think that's the perception. And when it comes down to it, perception is reality. And that's the story of Portland. Portland used to be uh, on the map uh, and in national news because we were the place to go to for foodies and food carts and for restaurants. And we were the place to go to for the natural beauty and our city because everyone was so nice. And because you could go and walk around and go to restaurants and you could go to arts and it was a weird place to come to see the fun, weird aspect uh, of Portland. And now we're not. The narrative is out of our control. And the story is, is that we're an example of what not to do and how things can go wrong and, and badly wrong. And I think we need to take that narrative uh, back, the control of that narrative and control our story and make Portland, because really Portland is, is what we make of it. And what we're going to try to do here with this, this, this program is to get those low level offenses that create the blight that we see when we go downtown, uh, the criminal mischief, which is like damaging other people's property, the theft, the trespass, uh, perhaps the dis disorderly conducts. Um, uh, there's a variety of low level misdemeanors that really add to and contribute to uh, the blight that one sees when they go downtown that makes it not inviting, that makes it feel like it's unsafe, makes it feel as though you don't want to bring your seven-year-old child downtown. And what we will do is, and what we have been able to do is, is we went to the court and said, court, Baltimore County Court, what would you think about this? And Judge Matarazzo said, absolutely, this is something we want to get behind. We were able to go to city council members and get buy-in from them. We were able to go to law enforcement, that is the sheriff's department and the police department, and get them to buy in. Uh, we've been able to go to the DA's office and get some buy-in from them. We have a lot of momentum behind this project, which essentially comes down to is that people will start getting cited again. And the DA's office will agree to prosecute, but that prosecution will be one that doesn't bury someone in a big, big hole that they can't get out of because at the end of the day, we have to have humane responses to what's going on downtown. We have a lot of problems that mix together, that is drugs and alcohol and homelessness that need to be addressed. So what we want to do is have some outward accountability for some of this behavior so that it stops. And we also need to kind of start the mechanism of having people charged and going through the system, but to get information. So what happens is, is low level offenses will be cited. They'll be cited into court and on a voluntary basis, they can come into our program and agree to do really two things. That is give us five or 10 hours of your life, either doing work or whatever it is. Maybe we can identify something else that they need that they can count towards this five or 10 hours with no fines and no fees. They get a dismissal if they do this. But the other thing that they have to do is that they have to submit to an interview. And this interview is comprehensive. The interview goes into get, gathering data on who we're working with, where are they coming from, what are they doing in our town, what services do they need, how can we help, drug and alcohol, homelessness, domestic violence, you name it, it'll be a comprehensive interview. And what we get from that is we get the data that we need to know to really serve this community because what we're doing now by doing nothing is enabling behavior and that's not going to get us anywhere. When we do the interview, we're not going to just stop there. We're going to support them in two ways. One, in the work groups that we have, we're going to restart work programs that stopped a long time ago. We're going to get new providers that will be included in the work program. We'll give them appropriate work for them to do given either their abilities or disabilities. And then on top of that, we'll give them uh, access to treatment providers. And when we say access to treatment providers, we're gonna search out the old ones, the, the new, and, and create hopefully new ones and find new ones. And we will get them to the help that they need. Now, the thing is with our program is that we're not going to force them to do any of the treatment because I think, and I, Eric, we heard this today from 
a wonderful lady who gave us a presentation to the governor's task force who was an addict herself for a very long time, who turned into a researcher who said, you can't force people to do treatment, but you certainly can put it in front of them. We have to give them good options for them to make good choices and decisions. And I think our program fits amazingly well into that, into that uh, preview. So if they go through this system, this is a system we have developed. We're, we're actually going forward with this, this, this program. They will get their dismissal and hopefully two things will happen. People will see a change in so much as there will be people working towards making our city better. We will see law enforcement, both the uh, charging and the prosecution doing their jobs as we perceive them that they should be doing them. And believe me, when we talk to the police officers, they want to be doing this job. They want to be able to address this type of crime, but it's been a long time since, uh, unfortunately, the DA's office has been actually prosecuting. And if you're not prosecuting, if you're a police officer, you're not charging because it's not gonna go anywhere. We need to start that system again. So I think it changes that perception on two oh, sides, okay. accountability for the agencies and accountability for the offender. Then at some point in time, we can get a change for the narrative of our story of our, of our city. So as far as the answer, as far as what our group can be doing, we're doing that in that particular aspect for crime and safety. I will switch this over to Tom and he can talk about his program. I'm actually going to go to Julia next. She's had her hand up for a bit and I don't want to, yeah, go ahead, Julia. Okay. Oh, thanks, Eric. I'll, I'll keep it short. I don't have as, as sophisticated a response as the one that we just heard. When I read this question and it said organization, I, I didn't jump first to RPC. I thought of our business and I thought of the business, you know, many other business owners that I know here in Portland. And I think just as a general statement, Portlanders care about the city and Portlanders want to be part of the solution. And I think that so that so many folks that I know, our company has been back in the office every day since summer of 2021, but so many others that I know would want their employees back and would be willing to be there to have their employees back. They just need to feel that their employees will be safe, that there's law and order, and that nobody will feel or nobody will be penalized economically for doing so. Um, I think I that's an important part. No, I, I think that's an, a, a very, very important part is encouraging employees to come back to work and occupy space in the in downtown. It I, I don't want to make it sound militant, but it we've got to take that area back uh, and make it ours again. And I think that's a big part of it is is encouraging and then also supporting by making it a safe place to be the downtown area. And I I, I encourage that. So thank you. I have, uh, well, I'm going to just hold my tongue. I don't, I get to talk all the time. Who else? Who else has got a <laughs> comment or a question? Go ahead, Darlene. I suddenly lost my screen. I can't see where who's got their hands up. <laughs> you know, one of the um, conversations I recently had with uh, <clears throat> planning and sustainability, one of the things that happened, I guess, while our eyes were closed is that there was a giant concentration of houseless services in the core of our city. Now, Old Town took a, br a, a bulk of them, which has caused a lot of problems because it concentrated our houselessness and affiliated problems into one area. It would be really good if we could convince our city that when a houseless service comes on board and they're and they're either getting a place or or maybe we even have codes written around this we should not have the an incredible concentration of houseless services in one location specifically within the core neighborhoods so i think that's something we've got to watch because um like right now we have just happening here in old town we have a whole nother building going up by Central City Concern. We have a whole nother building going up by Blanche House. Nothing against those services, but again, we're concentrating more houseless services into Old Town, which is already suffering dramatically, and that will flow into downtown. So I'm thinking that, and I have a meeting with these folks tomorrow. I'm, I want to start pushing. They when they we've got to look at dispersing. Uh, houseless services and 
house of services throughout the city. They should not just be concentrated in the six core neighborhoods. And right now they are. So we need, yeah. they need, we need to be looking at that as we're planning sustainability in the city. Darlene, I think that's a great point and also illustrative of how we have to look at our planning and zoning regulations and our planning right. and zoning plans. Um, the other point I would make is that the, the days of all the folks that need services are just in the central business district are over. I mean, yeah. we see migration and we see lots of encampments, et cetera, all across the region. And, you know, it, yes, locating near where the resident, where the services are needed is important. Well, that doesn't necessarily just mean downtown. And that's where we have them. Yeah. That's where the bulk yeah, of them it's are. Almost, yeah. It's almost like it's kind of rote that we, we do that. Yeah. Other, uh, responses or, or question, comments to top three things. Tom, I think, are you back? Did I see you? Do you mind just doing a quick um, overview of kind of the homelessness work that we're doing? We, we wanted to make sure our stuff ended up in this, the three, the three, uh, the three things. Be on the spot. Oh, okay. Uh <laughs> Well, I, I think that the main work that's been done recently really is by you, Eric, and uh, also Jerry and Jose testifying in front of multiple city and county uh, hearing and multiple hearings. I think that that's I would like to say that that's made a big difference. Um, you know, you, Eric, you told the story of Jerry testifying, and then I think it was one of the county commissioners texting him right afterwards. Her staff person was saying, mm -hmm. "Let's let's go talk about what mm -hmm. you were just saying." And and so I I think that that it's having an effect. And I do want to uh, congratulate ourselves and then everybody else who's really advocated because I think that the county's new budget with uh, use of those uh, the tax funds from the SHS tax that's that's a, a substantial step away from housing first, which has kind of been the the mantra so far in, in our government. And so I, I think that that's some progress. There's there's obviously a long way to go. And uh, we do have our letter to the county requesting number one, an audit, and number two, uh, I would say increased use of the uh, by name list, the, the built for zero methodology uh, for trying to track and provide data-driven help to those who need it, um, specialized spe uh, help specific to them. And Keith Wilson had some great perspectives on that in our homelessness uh, meeting earlier today, and, and I'd be happy to share those somehow. And um, it, he had a great presentation. So we have a lot going on. Um, but as I said in our, our board meeting recently, there's a lot more for us to do. Thank you, Tom. Good, yep. good summary. Somebody, I miss somebody. All right. Well, let's shift to barriers to block progress uh, as we make these improvements. Um, and we've talked about a lot of these. Are there things that we've not mentioned or talked about um, uh, as of yet that you all would want to make sure we add? Who's on my screen? Feel free to just speak out. Go ahead, Glenn. Yeah, I think, you know, we all know we're going through uh, a change in government. And there's so much un uncertainty uh, happening within the next uh, year or so, even longer. So I think that could be one thing that could block pro any progress. It's just a change in government that uh, Portland's going to be experiencing. Good question. Good point. Um, also, you know, we'll have 12, 12, 12 council seats up next year. Mayor seat. Yes. Anybody's interested in running? Um, Along those lines, Eric, what I'm I'm trying to think of a good way to put this. Um, what could block us is lack of openness or lack of flexibility in new ideas. Um, not being receptive to different ways of doing things. Am I am I doing okay with very well said? Not just making a broadside against a certain you know government body or anything. <clears throat> Especially when we have twelve people on the city council that at that level too. That's. I, I think also we've got 
um, an allocation of resources problem in the county, city, county. Um, I think we've got some resources that could be allocated in, in a better direction. Um, I think money will always be an issue. It might be a barrier, but at the end of the day, it's it's really how we allocate our resources. Um, I think bureaucracy also can be a, a progress. Um, I don't know, sometimes it seems to me there's too many studies before we have to take a, a positive step. Um, and sometimes we just need to take that step, but uh, it's more personal than anything, but my two cents. I would, um, I would just add to Tom's comment. I mean, I think the status quo or the desire to um, not look at the dramatic changes that we need, particularly in, in some of these issue areas, um, is very, very strong. And um, there's a, I think what we've learned is this, you know, conversation and work that's gone on at the county is how that status quo often is focused on minimizing conflict, I think. And so, you know, as we've shown up and many others on this call, et cetera, uh, as the recovery community has shown up, as, as folks, you know, calling out our, our dismal um, drug and alcohol and, and mental health recovery uh, system have pointed out that, you know, just keeping the parties that have been engaged in the past happy, meaning the groups that get funded or, you know, the, the advocacy groups or, you know, that the, those, those dynamics have shifted. And, you know, we, a lot of us, you know, never thought we'd get into this work, right. And do this, like be talking about mental health and, and drug addiction, et cetera. Um, but people are so frustrated that, you know, it's, it's, that's the new convert. That's the conversation I think they have to catch up with and adapt to. And I, my experience has been that a lot of it's just been like, you know, minimizing the old conflict. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, a part of the dynamic that we really want to shift. Um, so I would add that, you know, that kind of status quo um, approach is a, is a, is a big barrier. Um, let's see, uh, Glenn, you've got your hand up. Yeah. Just one more thing. I, I, I think a, a lack of a shared vision or a lack of uh, urgency that we all see within our city. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that the, the leadership part of it is, is one of the issues that we probably don't address uh, enough. And for us to recover, we, we need leadership. And, and as citizens of our city, we have to get together and uh, get a vision that's consistent. Uh, Wyden Kennedy is, is promoting uh, a new, uh, campaign is hmm. called Portland is what we make of it. And, and this is something that we, we all know what we want Portland to be, but we, we need something to, to rally behind and, and get together. Well said, Glenn. Uh, Julia. Oh, you're muted. Julia, you're muted. You're good. Sorry, it's like it's March 2020 and I just <laughs> forgot all the rules. <laughs> You're fine. I know the rules yet. Um, I think, and, and this is mentioned by the last speaker with respect to the vision that the task force lays out, we also need to, we need to understand, we need policies to address these things. We need a clear vision articulated by our officials. We need dates by which they plan to achieve things and we, as the citizens need to do our part by making sure that they're held accountable to those goals and actions. Well said, well said. That's part of our thing with the county is that those, those, those uh, we wanna hold them accountable. And so you try to hold it accountable to their, you know, the goals and outcomes and those don't exist. And we need them going exactly. forward. Um, Okay, we're we got 14 minutes left. We're gonna move along. Um, I we're so our next our final question is what specific concrete actions to the city and its partners take to support revitalization and or remove barriers to the community actions identified? I mean, again, you guys have started to answer this already. 
um, in, in just even the last set of responses, but are there other specific concrete actions that we want to make sure we identify? Julia, is your hand up again, or is it from before? <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Sorry, I'm acting like I've never used Zoom. I apologize. It's fine. No, I didn't mean to call you out. <laughs> Go ahead, everybody. I can't, I've lost my little screen thing again. So if somebody's got a comment, go ahead. I would add to this, like one thing I think about related to the um, task force itself is one of the values is that we see that the governor has committed her you know, at least some of her political capital and to the to the effort, right? To the she's tied herself her part of her political reputation to the future of of the central city, which is not insignificant. Um, one thing I think about related to the task force is, you know, they they're meeting in this specific set of time. They report back on the 11th of December, and we'll send around the info about the conference where that's going to get reported out but is specifically like, okay, within this period of time, what do we need to identify the state to do? Again, because the governor is, you know, kind of leaned into this. Um, you know, we know the county and the city and what they're trying to do and how they fight with each other. Um, but what other specifics do, you know, we want to make sure that the state can address? And, and you know, I think one of those topics that did not, we, that bubbled up a little bit in our conversation, but is around land use, um, around infrastructure and buildable land. Um, we know that, uh, you know, I think that was kind of a notable absence in what the governor has talked about in the past. And since all of these issues are so connected to one another, um, you know, you can't really develop a whole lot of affordable housing, particularly a very affordable housing, if you don't have that continuum of housing happening across all income levels. So I think a a piece I will make sure that we put in there is that the state is supporting, you know, not just Portland, but our municipalities in developing infrastructure so that they can make sure we've got housing of all levels happening um, in the region. So are there any other items like that, that um, like the, you know, from the state focus that anybody would want to make sure that we include? I want to throw this out, and I'm not sure it actually belongs in the answer to this question or not, but um, the, um, oh God, I just lost it. Um, I, I lost it. Sorry, guys. It's okay. <laughs> I don't know where it went, but it was right there a second ago. I'm going to throw something out there and you think on yours, Darlene, and okay. this is more on a state future, what's happening with electrification and decarbonization and expenses that all the landlords are going to have to take over the next, you know, five years or so. And to think twice about what you're implementing in your timelines and, and what everybody's already paying for this and that and taxes and homeless tax. And it's just one more nail on the coffin that is not going to help bring business to Portland. I'll throw in here. The one thing that I did want to sure. say is I worry about this not happening. I feel like the trend has shown us that houselessness is going to be with us for probably forever. And I worry that we plant, we are planning our housing on a short-term basis and not planning houselessness into the long-term. So I do believe in the long-term, we are going to have to have places for the tents that come into Portland to go to, a place to be, a place to check in at. And I don't think we're planning, I think we're planning everything temporarily. Like mm -hmm. our, our transition sheltering is temporary, our Micro villages are temporary. Our safe rest villages, temporary. The mayor's campuses, temporary. I think we have to start thinking long term about how we're going to be dealing with our houseless into the future because I do believe it's with us for forever. And to, so to plan for it temporarily is not going to help us into the future. And I don't think anybody's doing that because every time I bring it up, it's, it's like a non-issue but it is something we have to be considering for our future five years down the road for sure. 
Yeah. And how much is the state doing? You know, they closed all the mental um, institutions down in Salem. And what about those reestablishing something on a state level? That's right. more than a week long hold or something like that. Good points. Good points. Um, we've got really good stuff in the chat. Um, Ryan suggested set up a formal private uh, sector program that continuously recruits and incentivizes retailers and restaurants, find the popular ones and get them to open another location, temporary free rent if necessary. That's an excellent suggestion that we can take on. Revisit, uh, Ellen said, revisit the public appeals process. Uh, and how it uh, rerails the housing production due to nimbyism. Urban growth process needs to be revisited in the, in the metro um, so that we can appropriately access what is truly buildable. Uh, I, that's near and dear to my heart. If you are interested further in that, let me know as well. I'm on the committee that is working on that projection for, for metro right now. And we'll say our voices are very, um, few and far between on that topic. However, there are local municipalities that are doing some really strong pushing on it. Uh, carousel on Pioneer Square with a Christmas with the Christmas tree. Love it. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's great. Um, uh, we've got so many good suggestions in the chat too. And so we appreciate um, everybody's uh, comments, feedback. We will do our uh, darndest to put this into an organized structure and uh, get get it to the task force itself. Um, I'll go through this. We recorded this video and I may share the video uh, directly with them as well. So they've got it to be able to see um, the comments themselves. Um, uh, other any other like closing thoughts anybody has or any other burning comments you want to make sure um, that you make before we sign off. Really appreciate the conversation today. I will say, I know we had um, uh, mayor staff on at the beginning of this meeting. I, I heard from uh, Andrew Fitzpatrick, who was listening in. Um, I'm not sure who else we all had participating, but um, it's we. It's good to have some new new faces and new folks in this in this space too in this conversation. Um, I, I'm going to share the link one more time with you for uh, filling out the questions. Um, if you didn't get a chance to do that or want to share it with somebody else to do that, please do. And uh, we will make sure that um, uh, we get that shared with the, the commission itself. Um, Jose and I were actually supposed to present this morning to a, a task force of the committee um, and we're, we, they ran out of time. We're going to speak next week on our um, uh, civil compromise program. Uh, so that's, uh, that's positive. Um, and uh, we'll keep, keep up that pressure as well. And then we'll circle back with everybody um, as a result of this meeting and share with you what we've reported to the, to the commission, to the task force. Um, any other closing thoughts from anybody? Let me give you five minutes back. We don't have anything else. Just I want to say thank you to everybody. Great input. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I feel, you know, I know we retreaded, we replowed ground that we've probably plowed before, but, um, you know, when the task force asked this of us, we felt like it made sense uh, uh, for us to do it so that we can make sure, you know, our voices are specifically uh, considered in this conversation. So appreciate your time today. And, uh, Hopefully we'll see you uh, soon. Our next meeting is uh, right now. It's the 20th of November at 1.30. Um, if we shift that for the holiday, we will let you know. But I uh, appreciate all of you. And we'll uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Have Thank a good you, week. Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. I got to make sure I save everything.